This is a story of one man's wounded pride and his revenge. A man who experienced Russia's loss of superpower status and who wants to restore his homeland to its former glory. In 2012, Vladimir Putin was elected Russian president for another six years. The former KGB agent had now already ruled the country for 12 years, during which he restored order to a country facing disintegration, silenced the opposition, and brought the media into line. But the pomp of the inauguration ceremony was deceptive. The election had left Putin weaker than ever before. The largest demonstrations since the collapse of the Soviet Union spread across the country. The protesters condemned alleged election fraud and called for Putin's resignation. Falling oil prices were causing widespread economic hardship and corruption was rife. Putin himself was accused of becoming one of the richest men in the world through graft. The ruler in the Kremlin was very worried and hid himself in his palace. And he started to fight back using a tried and tested method, accusing the West, America and the CIA of conspiring against him. We do have serious concerns about the conduct of the elections. Russian voters deserve a full investigation of all credible reports of electoral fraud and manipulation. And we hope in particular that the Russian authorities will take action on the recommendations that come forward. Putin had heard this statement by the American Secretary of State on TV the night before, as had most of Russia. He called it a declaration of war. <laughs> деятелям внутри страны дала сигнал. Они этот сигнал услышали и при поддержке Госдепа США начали активную работу. To maintain his power and mobilize the Russian public, Putin wanted to make Russia a world power again and recover the status lost to the West 20 years earlier with the collapse of the Soviet Union. But in order to achieve that, he first needed to reconfigure his own power structures. He shut out liberals and surrounded himself with hardliners. Many were either former KGB agents like him or loyal oligarchs. His friend Vladimir Yakunin, a former KGB officer, wealthy businessman and pious creditor, joined the inner circle that unofficially advises the Russian president. With the dissolution of the Soviet system, it seemed that there were no any ground for more ideological struggle. When somebody decides that he possess the only truth, which is truth to everyone, that is domination. And that can lead to actual era of new war, whatever, you know, ideological war or cold war, whatever. This new cold war is, of course, directed against the winners of the previous one, against the U.S. and its armed extension in Europe, NATO. Since the collapse of the USSR in 1991, the transatlantic alliance has encroached on Moscow's sphere of influence. Poland, Romania, and the Baltic states, which were occupied by Soviet forces, sought NATO's protection. NATO carried out a series of large-scale maneuvers in response to Putin's nationalist rhetoric, a rhetoric that worried his neighbors. The United States pushed ahead with plans for a new state-of-the-art missile defense system throughout Eastern Europe. Putin saw that as an unacceptable challenge to his quest for power. 
In June 2012, he confronted the Western Alliance at the G20 in Mexico, an economic summit that brings together heads of state once a year. Behind the scenes, these summits give the participants a chance to weigh each other up, to negotiate, and to display their own strength. A modern equivalent of the battlegrounds on which the great powers used to meet. This is military and political system of the Western world. From this point of view, if you know the threat of communism disappeared, the simple question is, why? Why NATO is growing? Putin hoped NATO's de facto leader would listen to what he had to say. He was meeting U.S. President Barack Obama on the international stage for the first time. Three years earlier, Obama had signaled a desire to reset relations with Russia. It was a tense meeting. It was not warm in any way. Putin lectured President Obama at length about all the misdeeds of the United States over the years, going back to uh, the Clinton administration and NATO enlargement. President Obama always engaged Mr. Putin in a spirit of uh, logic. Uh, and the logic that we saw in the relationship was not necessarily the same logic that Mr. Putin saw. When somebody is trying to assure you, listen, I come with my tanks, I come with my, you know, military equipment to your backyard, but be calm, that is not against you. Would you believe? And then there was also, I think, a geopolitical argument that uh, the West should take advantage of this time to move east and to make sure that Poland and Hungary and Estonia are forever outside Russia's sphere of influence. Free states should be able to say, we're in NATO, we're not in NATO, we're in the EU, we're not in the EU. Who is Russia to tell them how they should behave? The deployment of the missile defense system was no longer negotiable. That's what Obama told Putin. The press conference was frigid. We have also discussed international affairs. All interested parties. Uh, in trying to find uh, a resolution uh, to this problem. From Obama's point of view, how important was Putin, the leader of a country with a gross domestic product that barely matched that of Spain? The meeting ended on a note of deep discord. They did not consider Russia the equal partner. Good, not that good, but equal. That way of behavior was a clear sign of the feeling of superiority. Kind of, you know, uh, body language to show, listen, you are not like me, so behave. I did not feel that there was a good personal relationship between President Obama uh, and uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, that for some reason, uh, that relationship was strained. And the result was that I think, in part, it contributed to a breakdown in the relationship between our two countries. Putin is very Russian. There is a big inferiority complex about how the West doesn't take us seriously. They see us as the kind of retarded little brother that they can just kick and insult all the time. They had been a great power that was on par with the US, that was calling the shots all over the world, and now people don't even listen to them. Not only was the West not listening to Russia, it was also moving closer and closer to Russia with its bases. In summer 2012, the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad, an old ally of Russia, faced an uprising. His opponents received weapons from Europe and the U.S. There was no doubt in Putin's mind that the West had ordered a regime change, as it had done in 2003 in Iraq and in Libya, where the deposed President Muammar Gaddafi had just been killed. 
when Vladimir Putin got a hold of the video of Gaddafi being killed, lynched in the streets, uh, he watched that video on repeat. He just watched over and over and over again. And apparently he did the same thing with the video of Saddam Hussein's execution. I think he takes these things very personally. I think Putin was watching it to understand that should someone stand up to the United States, and should there be a real fight, real confrontation, one should expect no mercy. The events of the Arab Spring also reminded Putin of the demonstrations against him that had taken place a few months earlier. In order to counter Western ambitions in Syria, he threw his weight behind a regime on the verge of collapse. Two years later, Ukraine, 2015. In the capital city, Kiev, the population rebelled against a corrupt and pro-Moscow leadership. The crowds loudly called for closer ties with the European Union. Even worse for Putin, the Americans were there. An Obama advisor personally handed out food to opposition activists on Maidan Square. Putin believed that after the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States should have committed itself to never integrating Ukraine into the Western camp. We had a coup d'etat, a state coup in, in Kyiv. Some, some uh, people would prefer to uh, interpret it as a kind of a, uh, reaction of the whole population of Ukraine against corrupted authorities. And this is a false description. February 15th, everything came to a head. The Russian hockey team played a decisive match against the United States. In Ukraine, the pro-Western opposition was increasingly undermining the government. It was a nightmare for Putin, who feared that the country would soon turn towards NATO, which would place the alliance just over 500 kilometers from Moscow. To the Russian president's great anger, the U.S. won in the penalty shootout. Putin called a meeting of his security council in Moscow. His plan was to invade Crimea, which was part of Ukraine. Its population is Russian-speaking, and there is a Russian naval base on the peninsula. But a military invasion of a European country was not an easy step to take. Putin deliberated and sought counsel. In the upper echelons of power, the hardliners demanded that he take the offensive. One of those making the case was Konstantin Malofeyev, a young oligarch and an ultra-nationalist champion of the great Christian Russia. That was his decision. And I can, again, you know, just to tell you uh, what I heard, that uh, it was not easy. And of course, uh, you know, that was uh, debated and realized there what would happen after and what would be the reaction uh, from, uh, from the West, from, uh, from Americans uh, who sponsored uh, uh, this uh, junta in Kyiv. And of course, you know, the, their reaction was obvious. Sochi. Putin believed that Obama would not dare to oppose him and gave the green light. On the 23rd of February, Putin attended the closing ceremony of the Olympic Games, and three days later, the Crimea awoke to find itself in the hands of Russian special forces who had landed during the night. One sovereign state, Ukraine, had been invaded by another, Russia.
we were surprised when he went into Crimea. We saw that this was a potential, um, but it was a surprise that he did it in the way he did. His goal is to keep Ukraine destabilized uh, and to make sure that it never completes any kind of Western orientation. He's not, as we like to think of him, especially here in the U.S., a grand strategic thinker and chess player. He plays blackjack. You know, it's a very high acceptance of risk. And that's a very Russian mentality. There's a Russian word called avoice, which is like, basically, I'll wing it and see what happens. Obama called Putin and talked for more than an hour, threatening him with sanctions if he went ahead and annexed Crimea. But Putin ignored the threats from the West and went even further. In the summer of 2014, Russian troops without uniforms started arriving in Donbas, an eastern region of Ukraine, to support pro-Russian separatist rebels against the new government in Kiev. It started a dirty war. What did they want, 500 miles from Moscow? They wanted us to stay and see how they would kill our people there. So we have to protect ourselves. And it means that to protect our interests uh, near our borders. The West suspected Malofeyev of financing separatists and imposed sanctions on him. For Putin and his entourage, the war came at a price. Around 50 people from Putin's circle were banned from traveling to the West and their assets abroad were frozen. Both Europe and the U.S. imposed heavy sanctions on oil exports, banking and armaments. President Obama объявил о новых санкциях, которые касаются примерно 20, опять же, физических лиц и одного финансового учреждения Банка России. Сколько физических лиц? Около 20. In February 2015, Putin finally agreed a ceasefire negotiated with the Western powers in Minsk. He had the upper hand in a conflict that he could ratchet up at will. He had ensured that Ukraine wouldn't join NATO or the European Union in the near future. But at what cost? May 2015 saw great celebrations to mark the 70th anniversary of the Soviet Union's victory over National Socialism. But the pomp was deceptive. Western sanctions had had an impact on the economy. The ruble had collapsed, and even the military budget had had to be cut back. Putin had promised the Russians glory, but they had paid dearly for that vision. Prices were rising, poverty was increasing, but he remained deaf to the worries of Russian business leaders. What mainly preoccupied him was the fact that he had become a pariah at the head of an ostracized state. The refusal of Western leaders to participate in this important anniversary was a devastating humiliation. Worse still, the man who wanted to rebuild Russia as a world power was even excluded from the G8, the summit of the world's leaders. He fancied himself uh, a great world leader when he was denied uh, a platform around the world, uh, and when people wouldn't meet with him, uh, I think that had an impact. So Putin was left with only provocation to remind the world that he at least still had a powerful army. For the first time since the Cold War, Russian jets buzzed American ships in the Baltic. But that brought Putin nothing but contempt from the president of the world's only superpower. Process, I think the overwhelming majority of the world rejects. Russia is 
a regional power that is threatening some of its immediate neighbors, not out of strength, but out of weakness. Is he crazy? You know, is he play basketball too much? You know, does he look at globe? Does he read anything in the history about Stalingrad? You know, he really believes that we are regional power. We are the only power in the world which has equal nuclear uh, power, military power, to the United States of America. At least it would be wise, even if you think so, don't tell it. Вы меня спросили, там, ваш покорный слуга, друг или не друг. Я не друг и не невеста, и, и не жених. Я президент Российской Федерации. 146 миллионов человек. У этих людей есть свои интересы, и я обязан их отстаивать. At the end of summer 2015, in his luxurious villa on the Black Sea, Putin suddenly seemed quite relaxed. He had understood that direct confrontation was not a good strategy for breaking out of isolation, and he had a plan. The time for revenge had come. В соответствии с вашим распоряжением, боевая авиация наших вооруженных сил с 30 сентября наносит удары по формированию... First of all, he pushed ahead with a daring move in Syria. Putin ordered a massive intervention in support of Bashar al-Assad's regime. Hundreds of missions were flown to destroy any resistance against the Syrian dictator in months of bombing. The West was surprised, but nevertheless allowed Putin to carry on, not without its own ulterior motives. Our calculation was that Russia risked being in a situation where uh, it was stuck, like Afghanistan, where over time it would have to spend more and more resources to prop up Assad. And thus far, Russia has uh, not become, unfortunately, exhausted by its intervention in Syria. The Russians wanted to avoid getting bogged down in Syria, and their intervention enabled the Assad regime to fight the rebels. The war in Syria was also a war of images. During the Syrian conflict, Putin saw how much he could use communications for his own ends. When your military budget is ten times lower than that of the United States, then it is a weapon of the weak. So he asked his new chief of staff, General Valery Gerasimov, to come up with a new military doctrine. The Gerasimov doctrine is one of hybrid warfare. Subversion, espionage, propaganda and cyber attacks are designed to influence the shape of an opponent's political and social landscape. The most important one, I think, is, is information, because it never stops. Information warfare is 24 by 7. It never stops. Uh, and in that information warfare, uh, the West, primarily the United States, have been designated uh, an adversary or even an enemy. In the presence of numerous guests, Putin celebrated the success of state television, which he had created to spread Russian ideas throughout the world. Я не смогу сегодня лично присутствовать в торжествах. В настоящее время я напряжен. Телеканал Russia Today доступен сейчас для 700 миллионов зрителей. И сегодня, когда ситуация в мировой политике, прямо скажем, сложна, как никогда важно, чтобы ваш и наш голос, вашу и нашу позицию слышали. Just like rockets and pipelines. Russia today is seen by Moscow as a strategic instrument. 
Russia Today is broadcast in five languages to about 100 countries. On the Internet, the technology at the heart of Russia's strategy, more people view its video clips than those of CNN and the BBC. A primary target of Russia today is the U.S. It's where the station has its most important bureaus worldwide. report shows viewers are leaving the mainstream media by the drove. So it looks like people are turning elsewhere to get their news. For example, a couple days after I had started, they there was a protest movement here called Occupy Wall Street, and they had covered that. We were we covered it actually extensively. Police brutality running wild in New York. We blew it out of proportion. And I'm, now I realize why. It's their dream to see uh, Americans protest and Americans themselves voicing their distrust of the system of, of American democracy and capitalism and Americans themselves saying that the system isn't working. Putin had understood that public opinion was the Achilles heel of Western democracies. In the early summer of 2016, he surely had this lesson in mind when Obama's Secretary of State visited him in the Kremlin. Well, Mr. President, uh, we're very appreciative for the opportunity to have a serious conversation about serious issues. John Kerry dampened Putin's hopes of a relaxation of sanctions if he did not change his policy in Ukraine and Syria. I, I believe a team from our Worse still, he announced the imminent completion of the missile defense bases behind Russia's borders. But what worried Putin even more was that six months later he might be dealing with an individual who was even more intractable, one he had publicly accused of sending a signal to his opponents back in 2011. Putin's red rag, Hillary Clinton, the firm favorite to win the 2016 U.S. elections. He's a very um, arrogant um, person to deal with. Like many bullies, he is somebody who will take as much as he possibly can. Russia is trying to move the boundaries of the post-World War II Europe. We've got to get NATO back working for the common defense. Faced with this prospect, Putin was surprised to see an outsider appear on stage, a populist who positioned himself as well-disposed towards Russia and critical of NATO. You know, Hillary likes to play tough with Russia. Uh, Putin looks at her and he laughs, okay? He laughs. Russia doesn't like ISIS any better than we do. Wouldn't it be nice if we actually got along with Russia and you could knock them out together? Wouldn't that be a good thing? The ch choice for us was between maniac, who is Clinton, mad witch, and hooligan, who is Trump, whom you would prefer to meet at the street, maniac or hooligan? Hooligan, of course, because with hooligan you have a chance. And with maniac there is no chance. The thing she was advocating was a no-fly zone in Syria. To me, that was invi an invitation to a shooting match between the U.S. forces and the Russian forces in Syria. Because Clinton was so Russophobic and so trained in this neoconservative style that I am now the leader of the gl global world and I have a rival province called Russia who is, you know, doing something wrong, of course we preferred uh, Trump. A type of hybrid war was launched against Hillary Clinton. Russian hackers pretending to be Americans generated more than a million hostile tweets against the Democratic candidate. Over several weeks on Facebook, their messages were shared with 126 million users. The pro-Russian media spread rumors and misinformation. The following video alone got 9 million hits. So in 2015, 96% of the Clintons' charity went to themselves. The rest of their charitable donations from that year went to an establishment named the Desert Classic Charities. That same year, that same charity made a $700,000 donation. We are so much surprised to see how frightened 
the so-called West uh, became uh, receiving just one single alternative channel from, from the East and from, uh, from Russia. And Putin kept going. What followed next was what the KGB calls active measures. A total of 10 advisors and associates from the Trump team were approached. The American intelligence services were facing an unprecedented scenario. In any what they call active measures, we would call covert action in the United States, efforts to influence an election or to influence the way a foreign government acts, is going to involve a human element. So I can say with almost certainty that Russians would be looking for people. We've seen information around the edges that suggests that perhaps some people around the Trump team had been engaging with the Russians. The notion that, hey, um, we can help you with information that we have on Hillary Clinton and your political opponents if, in turn, you take the idea of Ukraine off the agenda. In other words, we can make a deal here. At the end of August 2016, three months before the elections, Putin's hybrid war was stepped up even further. Hackers gained access to the Clinton team's computers to steal emails containing content that compromised Hillary Clinton. Voting machines were also the target of attacks. The heart of American democracy was under threat. This time, U.S. Secret Services were no longer in doubt as to who was behind it. Our intelligence community was able to um, conclude that there was a serious effort on, underway by Russia to interfere with the election. They say that Vladimir Putin directed an information operation against the United States elections and that his goal was first to weaken American democracy, to get us to fight amongst ourselves, and second, to increase the chances of Donald Trump and decrease Hillary Clinton's chances. The Obama administration was perplexed by this unprecedented attack. How do you defend yourself against it? A cyber attack on Russian infrastructures was under consideration. We spent a lot of time on to decide whether there should be some um, price paid for what they'd already done, some punishment. That last piece, we thought, could wait, uh, and we could, think, we could work on it and think about it. The most important thing was to get them to stop and prevent them from doing it again. The White House decided to treat the case with the utmost secrecy. Because we thought the main Russian objective was to create doubt and accelerate a crisis of credibility and legitimacy uh, about our institutions, we had to be very careful in how we talked about this in public. Uh, because even if we had said, and the president had said, this is what they're trying to do, but they won't succeed, <laughs> it still might have created the very doubt Russia was trying to sow. They thought that Hillary Clinton would win under any circumstances. Uh, they didn't want to uh, develop a whole new political issue. Classically Obama. You know, it was uh, paralysis by analysis. Let's talk about it, let's think about it, let's, um, let's get it just right. You know, it's the exact opposite of Putin, who doesn't consider all the strategic implications. They want to consider every possible angle, every possible repercussion. There were a lot of lawyers in the room to make sure they didn't break any laws. Obama therefore decided to clarify the matter himself in private with Putin on the sidelines of a G20 meeting in China, which had long been planned for September 5th, 2016. But the president was very direct and very clear with Mr. Putin that we knew what they were doing, it had to stop, and if, the, and if it didn't, there would be consequences. Nobody, neither Mr. Obama nor any security service in the world has ever provided us with any kind of evidence of Russian interference. Blah, blah, blah. We know that you have interfered. It's very difficult to deal with someone who, um, again, uh, lies on a regular basis. He's a former KGB officer 
I think intelligence officers around the world have very similar way of looking at the world. There's a bar at our training facility that has sort of a funny phrase up above the bar that says, admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations. So there were so many very sensitive, very delicate issues which could have damaged the election campaign of Madame Clinton that uh, some genius in, in, in her administration invented this way out blaming Russia for, uh, for meddling. Everything we saw after that suggested that, as far as we could tell, Russian efforts to exfiltrate information and then turn around and use it in some fashion seemed to stop. But at that point, it was actually too late uh, because they had given it to third parties um, and, at, and those parties could put out the information whenever it was convenient for months and months to follow. This third party was the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks. On October 7th, 2016, one month before the election, the CIA finally published its information on Russian influence. Secretary Clinton, Mr. Trump. The Russian government has engaged in espionage against Americans. I in the following hours, WikiLeaks released the hacked emails from Hillary Clinton's team, weakening the candidate considerably. To run for the presidency. She I has no idea whether it's Russia, China, it, or anybody else. In this close election in which every vote counted, the months of Russian interference were of great importance for the outcome. Vladimirovich Putin. Хочу поздравить американский народ с завершением избирательного цикла господина Дональда Трампа с победой на этих выборах которые были направлены на восстановление отношений между Россией и Соединенными Штатами. The former lieutenant colonel of the KGB had pulled off a masterly coup by influencing an American election. Now he even played the role of godfather to the new president of the world's leading power. How he must have savored his revenge. Putin had come a long way since the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the 1990s, Washington had made his predecessor, Boris Yeltsin, its vicarious agent. But Putin now still had to get what he was after from the newly elected U.S. president. First, the lifting of sanctions against his country. Secondly, the suspension of NATO enlargement. In July 2017, he finally met Donald Trump. Nice to be with you. At eye level, with an American president at last. This personal meeting, which Putin considered crucial, had been carefully orchestrated with the American team. Russian protocol insisted for a longer time of tete a tete meeting. President Putin called himself a master of human uh, relations. Putin was hoping to establish some kind of personal chemistry. You see Trump, if you meet with him one-on-one, -on -one, if you're able to give him the impression that you click with him, that you understand him, that you think he's, you know, brilliant, um, if you flatter him, he'll give you what you want. The American insisted on shorter time of that, that, that meeting. Thank you. That would give you a key why uh, their meeting in, in Hamburg was interrupted, because uh, nobody want to meet President Putin, you know, to talk tete-a-tete. Uh, -tete. So that's, that was their point. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Putin had to face facts. Trump couldn't commit to anything and remained evasive. He is kind of being bandashed, if you know what I mean. And he cannot do what he promised to do. No agreements were, uh, were reached, and we are still uh, far, far away from each other, and I believe that we lose time. 
Putin had not expected that by trying to thwart Hillary Clinton, he may nevertheless still face a weakened president and a United States that was more hostile than before. Trump's hands were tied by an investigation into his relations with Russia. Rather than lift sanctions against Moscow, Congress reinforced them, furious over Russian interference. The former head of the FBI, James Comey, testified before the Senate Intelligence Committee. But we're talking about a foreign government that using technical intrusion and lots of other methods tried to shape the way we think, we vote, we act. That is a big deal. But Putin had no intention of stopping. Moscow is now also suspected of having interfered in the 2016 Brexit referendum and in the French presidential elections in the spring of 2017. You know, I think that, that Putin is a very complicated mix of someone who is tactically quite shrewd, uh, but at the same time, he, he is caught up in his own rhetoric. In the long run, is this a win for Russia, that it's isolated? that it faces economic sanctions. This is undoubtedly the price Putin has paid for his revenge on the West. For now, it has allowed him to hold on to power in Russia. But where will his desire for revenge lead? How far is President Vladimir Putin prepared to go? Российский солдат и сегодня, как во все времена, 